Galatians. The book of Galatians, chapter 4. Chapter 4. I want to apologize for this morning. I didn't get through but one point of my sermon. Somebody asked me, I think it was Kim, asked me on the way out, are you going to preach the rest of it tonight? And I'm not. I am not. That one's gone forever. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll get to another sermon where I can work those two parts in somewhere up the road, okay? But uh, tonight we're going to be looking in Galatians chapter 4. And I want to begin with verse 1. And the Bible says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. What an unusual verse. I want you to stop and think about that verse for just a moment. I'm going to read it again. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, oh, how we praise you and thank you for your word. God, what a blessing it is. God, how it thrills our soul every time, Lord, we come and, and partake of it. When, God, we read it and we listen to to what you have to say to us. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truths that it holds. And God, tonight we want to focus on one special truth. And God, to think about what that truth means. And I pray, Father, that God, you just take control. Lord, I, I, I'm looking to you. God, to use this, to bless this, and God, to bless each and every one that hears. Pray, Lord, if there be anyone here and they're not saved, that God, tonight, they might receive Christ. I pray, Lord, that we as Christians will take heed, God, to this great truth, and Lord, that we'll act accordingly. Father, that's what the message is all about. So, Father, you use this to glorify thy Son, to glorify thy name, and, God, to do thy perfect will in every heart. And, God, we'll give you the praise, and we'll give you the glory for it all. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You know, as I read this passage of Scripture, there are many, many wonderful truths here. Truths about God sending his son. Truth about Jesus, a born of a virgin. Truth, beloved, about him being born under the law. Truth about our redemption through Christ. But the truth found here, beloved, that I want to engrave upon your hearts and minds tonight is this. That God has an appointed time. Let me say that again. God has an appointed time. Folks, our God never does things haphazard. Amen? I mean, nothing takes God by surprise. God doesn't wake up, beloved, one morning and say, Well, I think I'm going to do this today. Or I'm going to do that today. Folks, God has already thought through everything, everything. And he has a plan. And he has appointed times for everything that he does. And we can see that in this scripture. Paul begins by using the example of an earthly father and his children. And he says, a child 
may be an heir, but his life differs little or differs nothing uh, than that of a servant, though he be Lord of all. He, in other words, and he goes on and says he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed by who? By the Father, by the Father. Did you see that? The Son, beloved, is as a servant under tutors, but the Father has a time appointed when the Son will take his rightful place as the heir of all. He has a time appointed. Folks, that's true of us. You know, we are, according to the word of God, we as Christians are joint heirs with Christ. That means, beloved, all that Christ has, guess what? It's ours too. But right now, we are servants, amen? But God has a time appointed when, beloved, we will receive our inheritance. Likewise, Jesus, God's only begotten Son, He came to this earth, beloved, born of a virgin. He came as a servant. He came, beloved, under the 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 tutor, uh, the tutors, and uh, under a tutor and a governor. The law was his was his his tutor and governor. He came, beloved, to redeem us. But God the Father has a time appointed when Jesus will receive his crown, beloved, when Jesus will take his rightful place on the throne of David, when every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen, beloved, God has an appointed time. And we call that time the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ. That's when, beloved, we will receive our inheritance. When Jesus returns to set up his kingdom. Amen? You Now, you all know, and I've said this many, many times, the second coming of Christ, in my opinion, is in two phases. There are two phases to the second coming. First, beloved, he will come in the air and he will rapture his church. He will catch us away, amen? And then the tri- this world will go into seven years of tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, he will come again all the way to the earth. Beloved, we will come with him and he will set up his kingdom on earth. It will be God's appointed time. God's appointed time. Listen to me. God had an appointed time when Jesus came the first time. Amen? I mean, for, for he had a time for Jesus to be born of Mary. Look at verse 4 in our scripture. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. God had a time an appointed time for Jesus to be born. God had a time, beloved, for Jesus to present himself as king and to die on the cross. If you doubt that, go to Daniel 9 and read verse 26. And it says after 62 weeks, after the 62 weeks, it says, beloved, that that a Messiah will be cut off. God had an appointed time. So you can be sure, beloved, that God has an appointed time for his second coming, for the rapture of the church and the glorious appearing, what we call the second coming. He's got a time. He's got a time. So what do we do? We wait for that appointed time. But what should we do as we wait for him to come. What should we do? Look with me. Look with me in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. The first thing that we should do as we're waiting for that appointed time, beloved, we should watch. We should watch. 
Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read several scriptures. Look at verse 36. Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Look with me, beginning with verse 40. But then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what I watched the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He says, watch, watch. Verse 42, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord does come. Folks, here Jesus tells us to watch. Now, this must have been amazing to the disciples when they heard this. I mean, if no man knows the day or the hour, what do we watch for? What do we watch for? I mean, if no man knows the day or the hour, beloved, what are we looking for? What are we watching for? And I think the answer's plain. We watch for the signs of his coming. Of his coming. But wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Preacher, you've told us a thousand times there are no signs of the rapture. That is exactly right. You get a gold star. There are no signs of the rapture. Oh, but there are signs, beloved, of the second coming. Amen? There are signs of the second coming. Folks, when we see the signs of the second coming, the glorious appearing, hey, we can know that the rapture is close. Amen? It's close. No, we don't know. There are no signs. But we can know the season. Amen? And beloved, when we see the signs of the second coming, the signs of the tribulation, and we know he's coming at the end of the tribulation, we know that the rapture, whoa, how close are we? How close are we to the rapture of the church? When we see the signs of his glorious appearing, his coming to rule, we know, beloved, we are close to the rapture of the church. You know, if you see people putting up Christmas lights, what are you close to? No, no, no. They put them up way for you know that. Thanksgiving. When they start putting up Christmas lights, you know, hey, Thanksgiving is upon us, amen? I mean, you know that. Likewise, beloved, if you see the signs uh, 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 of, the, of the world uh, being uh, on, on the verge of the tribulation, beloved, that is a sign of his glorious appearing. And that means that the rapture is fast upon us is fast upon us. You know, if I see Joe, suppose I'm going down the road there in Wilson and I see Joe out there in that vacant lot there at Walmart and he's put up that little little barn that they use and he's stringing lights around, you know, and I know that he's going through church, these young boys, and saying, hey, you want to help sell trees this year? If he's doing all of that, I don't see any trees but you know what I know? I know the trees are coming, amen? I know the trees are coming. If I see, beloved, listen, likewise, if I see Russia and Iran and Turkey and, beloved, they are cozied up to one another and I see them working together on Israel's border, beloved, listen, I don't see a war yet, but I know that the battle of Gog and Magog is coming. It is coming. 
And beloved, the battle of Gog and Magog happens, in my opinion, a short while, beloved, before Jesus comes back. Before Jesus comes. You know what we're seeing on the news? Those very things. Though just like God mapped out in Ezekiel chapter 38. Exactly, exactly. If I see beloved progressives and they are moving toward a one world government and I know that, beloved, the Bible says that there will be a one world government before Jesus returns. I know that his coming is close at hand. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing. If I see, as I spoke about this morning, a spirit of lawlessness suddenly, beloved, uh, uh, just a uh, covered the world I know that Antichrist is the lawless one and I know beloved this world that spirit of Antichrist is preparing the way for him I know then that Jesus is coming soon he's coming soon and if I see all these things now get this if I see all these things and many more things happening at the same time, you better believe I know Jesus is coming soon. And if the second coming is that close, I know, I know, I know, I know that the rapture is any day now. Any day now. Any day. Folks, there are signs of his second coming, of God's appointed time. And we are told to watch for them. Why should we watch for them? That brings me to the second thing that we should be doing while we wait. We should watch because, beloved, uh, so that we might be ready when Jesus comes. We should watch that we might be ready when Jesus comes. In Matthew 24, verse 44, I read it to you a moment ago. Jesus said, therefore, be ye also, what? Ready. Therefore, why? You know, why therefore? What is he talking about? Therefore. What was before that? Watch for the signs. Watch. Therefore. Therefore, when you see the signs, be ye also ready. Be ye ready. Beloved, listen to what I'm going to say. So we watch. We watch that we might be ready when the Lord comes back. Now the question is, how do we get ready for the most tremendous event the world has known to this time. What, next to the cross or equal with the cross. How do we get ready? First and foremost, we get ready by nailing down our salvation. In other words, beloved, know, know, know that you are saved. Know it, know it. Be sure of your salvation. Listen, be sure, and you'd be surprised at the number of Christians who you asked, are you going to heaven when you die? And they'll say, I hope so. And they call themselves Christian. And they call, and I've even had some tell me, you can't know. You better read the book of 1 John because over and over John says, I write these things unto you that ye might, may know you have passed from death unto life. Unto life. But so many, beloved, don't know or have doubts. Be, you know, be sure you've got oil in your lamps. In chapter 25 of the book of Matthew, Jesus gives the parable of the ten virgins. And they're going, beloved, to the wedding. And, and, they've got, and, and there's ten of them. And they, they, they're, they're, they're waiting. And then suddenly they hear a cry, the bridegroom cometh. And five are called foolish virgins. Why? Because they have no oil in their lamps. 
And you can't get in without oil in your lamp. You know what that oil symbolizes? Come on, you know. The Holy Spirit of God. And beloved, when you get saved, the Holy Ghost of God comes in and indwells you. Amen? Amen. Beloved, that is sure that you are saved when you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Indwelling you. Be sure you got oil in your lamps. Those ten, beloved, had no oil and the door was shut and they couldn't get in. Folks, if you have any doubts about your salvation, listen to me because I'm saying this with tears in my eyes. Settle those doubts now. Now. Have you repented of your sin and received Christ by faith as your Savior? Are you trusting in Him alone, beloved, for your salvation? Have you been Born again, beloved, born by the Spirit of God. Not just join a church or not just get baptized, but be born again by the Spirit of God. Is there a change in your life? You say, what kind of change, preacher? Here's one. Do you, beloved, desperately want to do right? Because if you do, you're saved. If you desperately want to do right and obey God and live for God, beloved, you are saved. I believe when a person is born again, beloved, God changes their want to. Before I got saved, I wanted to sin. I wanted to do wrong. I wanted to disobey God. But brother, when I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, I wanted no part of it. I no part of sin. I wanted no part of it. You mean, preacher, you don't sin anymore? No, 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 I didn't say that. I'm in this old body of flesh. And sometimes, beloved, at our very best, we give in to the flesh, don't we, Christian? Come on. Yes, we do. We're not perfect, but oh, we desire to be like him. We desire to follow him. We desire, beloved, to live and obey him. And I'm going to tell you, if you want to know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get into this in just a minute, but I, I, these folks who say they get saved and they go right back, beloved, out there in the same stuff, I mean, don't even stop to say, excuse me, ma'am. And they go right back to get it from the altar and go, brethren, I, I'm, I'm not their judge, but I got my doubts about them. Amen. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. Amen. By their fruits. If you would be ready, when Jesus comes, be sure about your salvation. If you would be ready for Jesus to come, beloved, listen to me. Listen to what I'm going to say now. Do inventory in your life. And beloved, whatever is sin in your life, repent and turn from it. You say, wait a minute, preacher. I, I'm a Christian. I don't sin. Then you just call John a lie. And you called, worse than that, you called God a lie. Because God inspired John to write in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, If any man has say he had not sinned. Let me read it to you. 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. He's talking to Christians. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In other words, John's saying it in a nice, polite, Christian way. You're a liar. You're a liar. At our best, we do wrong. That's why he gave us verse 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all un righteousness, all unrighteousness. But you know, you got professing Christians, like I said, that beloved say they're, sin, say they're saved 
and they never break stride. They keep on doing the same wicked things they were doing, beloved. Now, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by grace through faith. But brother, when you get saved, you don't, you are a new creature. You don't want to do those things. You don't want to live that way. You don't want that. You want to please God. You want to please Him. But yet they'll go out and do these things and say, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm going to tell you something. I know where to get it from. I know where they get it from. They get it from these guys who get up and say, oh, you say that sinner's prayer and you are eternally secure and you cannot lose it. Hey, that means I can keep on living the way I'm living and I'm going to go to heaven. That's blasphemy. I believe in eternal security of the saved, of the believer. And if you truly believe, beloved, you don't want to do those things anymore. You don't want to do them anymore. Listen, look at, look at 1 John uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. Listen to this. John makes it so plain. He said, he that committed sin. Now let me explain this. He's not talking about if you go out and, and, and in a moment of weakness you, you sin. He's talking about, beloved, if you live in continual sin, continual rebellion against God. That's what this, if you go back to the Greek, that's what he's saying. But he that committed sin, lives in continual sin, is of the who? Devil. Devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus died to set you free from sin, beloved. If you continue on in sin after you are saved, I mean willfully disobeying your Lord, I didn't say it. God said it through John. Ye are of the devil. Ye are of the devil. Listen. If you would be ready when Jesus comes, at our best, beloved, we have little sins in our life that we do. There's not a person in here, me first of all, that don't have little sins in our lives. I won't say little because there are no little sins that don't have sin in their life. Why don't we put it aside? Why don't we take it and put it under the blood of Christ? You don't want to stand before God with that thing that you know is wrong, that's in you or, or that you're a part of. You don't want to stand before God. And beloved, if you're watching, you know you could be standing apart or standing before him before this service is over. Put that sin away. Put it under the blood. And start obeying God. And start obeying God. Somebody says, preacher, I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by grace. Folks, listen to me. Grace don't give us a license to disobey God. It don't give us a license to disobey God. The Lord did not save you by grace through faith unto evil works. He saved you by grace through faith unto good works. You read it. Ephesians chapter 2. Unto good works. He saves us to obey Him, to follow Him in faith and love. Be ready by, by, be ready by repenting of those sins in your life, cleaning your life up. First John 1 John 1.9, by confessing those sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive you those sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Be ready. Be ready, beloved, by serving 
until he comes. In other words, while we're waiting, do his work. Amen? Isn't that what a servant does? He does the work of his master. Amen? Do his work, beloved. Listen, he has left us here to serve. To serve. Why didn't he just take us to heaven once we got saved? Because he had a job for us to do. To do the work of Christ, beloved, here on this earth. That's why. That's why you're not up in heaven right now. Because he's got work for you to do. Uh, the, co- the work in the cause of Christ. To glorify the Lord in all that we do. And all that we say. And all that we are. We're not here to serve ourselves. But to serve Jesus. Amen. To serve Jesus. And in our service, guess what? We are witnesses unto him. I mean. People, beloved, see our good works and they glorify God. That's what the Bible says. Beloved, the people see our love and, and humility and it glorifies God. People see us living for him and it glorifies God. And through that service, beloved, souls are one to Christ. I can't tell you the number of times people have told me I came to Christ because I saw something in that person that was genuine and real. And that brought me to Christ. That brought me to Christ. So be ready for for the appointed time, beloved, of his return. It means to be doing the work of Christ to be serving. Look in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, look with me at verses 42 through 44. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom the Lord will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing, so doing. Of a truth I say unto you. That he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But are Christians doing these things? Are they getting ready? Most are not. Most are not. You see they continue on beloved being unfaithful. They continue on being disobedient. They continue on not serving. And many, beloved, are even not sure they are saved. And and you just want, you look at them and you want to say, hey, don't you see the signs of his coming? And some, if they're honest, would say back, no, no, I don't. I'm not really watching Because I don't really believe he's coming. I don't really believe he's coming. And others would say, oh yes, I'm watching. Preacher, I see the signs. They're everywhere. Then why aren't you getting ready? And they give you a blank stare. Why aren't you being more faithful? Why aren't you being more loving? Why aren't you serving? Why aren't you doing? Why aren't you getting the sin out of your life? And they give you a stare. Oh, but the others, the others who are truly watching are getting ready. They're getting ready because they know that God's appointed time is almost here. There's one other thing that we must do as we wait. Folks, we must be patient. We must be patient. I don't know about you, but I get so impatient sometimes. Am I the only one? Man, I'll go somewhere with Martha. Martha went to school with every person in Wilson County. 
And they were all in her room. I'll go somewhere with Martha, and up will come somebody. Hey, girl, how are you? Oh, well, how are you doing? And I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll stand there and wait and wait. They're going to it. I'll walk out, buddy. I'll walk outside like we are in a store. Uh, a lot of times it happens at Cracker Barrel. I'll look at everything in the store, and she's still going. I'll walk outside. And finally, here she comes. Here she comes. And I am, I am so, I mean, I'm impatient. I'm impatient. Beloved, we can't afford to be impatient, waiting for Jesus. We can't do it. We can't do it. I get so impatient. We don't like to wait. But Jesus warned us about that. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verses 45 and 46, listen to this. But if that ser servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maid servants, and to eat and drink and be drunken, the, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Notice what this says. He said in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. He didn't say it with his mouth. He would never do that. But deep in his heart, beloved, he said he's not coming. And beloved, it's from the heart that, the, 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 that proceeds the issues of life. Amen? Amen, Kathy? Amen. That's where it comes from. In other words, what you truly, truly believe in your heart will show itself in your life, Amen. in your actions. That servant got impatient waiting for his Lord. So he began to, to believe in his heart that the Lord had delayed his coming and that belief began to manifest itself by his actions, by his actions. I would ask you tonight, have you become impatient waiting for Jesus to come? You know how long I've been waiting for him to come? 50 years. 50 years. From the time I got saved, I've been looking for Jesus to come. I've been waiting for 50 years. But you know what? If he leaves me here, I'd wait another 50. I'd wait 100. I'd wait 1,000. Is that why people don't watch anymore? Because they've said in their heart, he's not really coming. Wouldn't say it with their mouth, but they say it in their heart. Is that why, beloved, people aren't preparing for his return because they said in their heart he's not coming. I don't know. I can't look in a person's heart. But I do know this. I know, beloved, what I do when I grow impatient about Jesus coming. First thing I do is I remember that God has an appointed time. An appointed time. His appointed time is not subject to my wants or to my desires or my situations or my circumstances. No, listen. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than me. God has, an appointed, has appointed that time because it is the best time for it to happen. Because, beloved, it's the time when he will get the most glory from it. Because, beloved, it's the time that will fulfill his perfect will. Because it's the time that will accomplish his glorious purpose. Hey, I want his appointed time to happen this moment, right now. 
Listen, I'm, I get tired of the struggles. I get tired of, of death, Chuck. I get tired of, of the pain and the sorrow. I'm tired of sin and evil. Oh, I want him to come right now, right now. But it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about him. Hey, I didn't give my son to die on a cross. God the Father did. Amen. I didn't, I didn't beloved, uh, uh, defeat Satan on Calvary. Jesus did. I didn't shed my blood. The Lord did. I didn't conquer death and hell and the grave. He did. Beloved, I am just a recipient of e eternal life, a heir, an heir to glory, all because of him. Amen. So he can come back. He can come back when God decides the time is right. The time is right. And I will wait patiently. Patiently. And I will be forever thankful that he included me, a sinner like me, that he included me in his plan of redemption. Folks, God has an appointed time. We don't know when. A time when Jesus will return, beloved, in the air and catch us away. A time when he will return all the way to the earth and take off his crown. And you and I are to wait for that time. But what do we do while we wait? We watch. We watch for the signs. We make ourselves ready because any moment we could be in his presence. And we wait patiently, ever grateful to be a part of God's wonderful appointed time. I want you to bow your heads and close. I can tell you something more sure than the sun rising tomorrow. Jesus is coming. He's coming. Folks, he could rapture his church any second, any moment. There's nothing to prevent him from coming right now. When he comes, will you be taken? Are you saved? Are you ready to stand before him? Have you got sin in your life that you know it's wrong, but you keep holding on to it? What if he came right now? He's coming in the twinkling of an eye. You're not going to have time to repent. You're not going to have time. If he came right now, would you be ready? Would you be ready? Do you know, do you know, do you know that you're saved and you've laid aside those things that are wrong? God's got an appointed time. We don't know when it is. But the rapture could happen before this day is through. How we need to be ready. And oh, how we need to be patient. To be patient. Check your heart. Look deep. May the Holy Spirit shine His light upon it. And you can see it. Have you laid aside that belief that Jesus could come any moment that he's coming. Oh, listen. Let God's Spirit have his way as we give this invitation. Father, we thank you for your love. 
We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, that he is coming. God, how we, how we can hardly wait to see you, to see him, to look upon his face and him take those nail-scarred hands and wrap around us and hold us to his bosom. And God, he looks at us and says, well done, thou good and faithful servants. Enter into the joys of the kingdom. Father, I pray that everyone here will hear those words. I pray, God, that we'll be ready and patient and watching. Father, have your way in this invitation. Do your work in every heart. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. I want you to stand. His